Good evening. It's glad to see you here in, this, in the Lord's house this evening. It's warm in here. It's cold outside. But it's delighted to see everybody here this evening. Um, Brother Jeremy and Miss Rebecca have been saying goodbye to Rebecca's grandmother this, this afternoon. So be in prayer for that family as they continue to do so. And, and I apologize, you're stuck with me. So uh, anyway... But we're going to get into our time of prayer requests and, and praises, and then we're going to sing a little bit, and then we're going to hopefully hear what the Lord has to say this evening. So um, do we have any runners that are going to help us out, uh, Brother Philip, or, or do we just need to shout real loud? Oh, here they come. When I said runners, I didn't mean light speed runners. I mean, I've seen those guys run. Just barely. It's just a blur every time they do. But if, uh, if you have a prayer request or something needs to be like Miss Day's right over here. Just raise your hand, and these guys will come to you. Go ahead. Yeah, I got a good friend at Winfield. Uh, had a house fire last night. Mm. They pretty much lost everything they had, and there was some there's some medical issues that's there prior before the fire. So okay. They need our prayers. Okay. Right, if yes, you don't care, I'd love for you to keep me in your prayers. I've got to be in. Tupelo in the morning to have a heart cath to see if there is any blockage in my heart. But regardless of what they find, I'm gonna have to have open heart surgery. Don't mm -hmm. know yet when, what, when, or what time. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Definitely. Um, last week I had mother to put uh, Susie Shots, one of my students, um, on the prayer list. She had been. In a week-long stay at Children's at that point, um, got to come home on Thursday, but Great. they airlifted her back to Children's mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. after um, several seizures, and her seizure medication wasn't being effective, uh, the rescue meds. Mm -hmm. So they're looking like they're going to be down there for another few days um, in Children's Hospital. So just pray for the Shots family, please. They ask that, that we continue to pray for them and keep them on the list. Okay. Yes, sir. I have a first first cousin over in Georgia mm -hmm. that he said lost uh, one leg and they amputated his second one this week. He's got a sugar to beat it and everything. So mm. okay. he needs our prayers. Maybe he's finding the Lord. Yes, sir. Reed, I had mentioned my cousin's husband last Wednesday night that they had sent him home on hospice and he passed Thursday mm. morning. Very so sure. um, you can take Matt Bradford off the list, but please continue to remember his wife and children. Okay. All right. Miss Anita, right down here. Please add my mother, Geraldine Green, to the prayer list. Um, she is having some problems with her kidneys, so please add her. Yes. Reed, uh, former there you are, right. judge, Rocky Ridings, okay. uh, had surgery yesterday on his tongue, and uh, last I heard that uh, he was uh, communicating by writing, uh, he had a trach and a feeding tube, mm -hmm. but um, Misty, his daughter, seemed to be encouraged. Okay. Rocky Ridings. Anyone else? Got a prayer or concern? Okay. How about praises this evening? Even if you can't think of one offhand, can you at least raise your hand and say, I can praise the Lord this evening? All right, at least we, we can all agree on that. Who has a praise that they might want to share with us? Miss, Miss Pam's right down here. And we praise the fact that you're here with us again, Ms. Pam. Yes, that's what I want to do. I just want to praise the <coughs> Lord and thank him that I'm here because it's by his mercy and his touch 
that I am. And I want to thank everybody that prayed for me. Everywhere I go, somebody comes up to me more than one and tells me that they prayed for me. Mm -hmm. And I thank them because the Lord touched me. I know that without a doubt. And that's the reason I'm here. And I want to thank David and my family, mm -hmm. my church family for everything. My heart is so full and just overflowed with the love that we've been shown. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell this, this, this is just a special thing to me, mm -hmm. is all the kids in preschool as I've been coming back, and it is amazing how many of them said, we've been, we've been praying, I've mm -hmm. been praying for you because their parents, I know, have told them I was sick and was praying. And so this little boy, uh, I guess it was Thursday or Friday, he said, He's looking at me. He's got this frown on his face. He's so sincere. And he says, Miss Pam, did the Lord really touch you? Because I had shared with him in chapel last week that the Lord had touched me and he had healed me. And I said, yes, he did. And I began to talk to him about that. And he's just really looking and really thinking about that. He just shook his head like this, like mm -hmm. he understood that. And then like two days later, He's come up to me. He said, Miss Pam, and he had this same frown on his face looking at me. He said, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and that just blessed my heart it so does. much. But I just wanted to, I, I thank the Lord because I know without a doubt the reason I'm here is because of his touch. Mm. And I just want to thank everybody for everything they've done and for all the prayers. And I just want to praise him for his goodness. Yes, ma'am. She actually led chapel this morning. Got up here and got the kids to sing Zacchaeus. Yep. Someone else would like to voice some praise this evening. Okay. All right. Well, hello, Brother Duran. Amen. Amen. Definitely, we can read it while we're rejoicing that. Amen. Someone else. The more you talk, the less I have to, so it's to your benefit. I know so many of you have been praying for Will Bailey and the whole Bailey family, and uh, we continue to get good reports from Florence and that he is improving a little bit every day. Um, the last uh, that I heard about his uh, breathing, that he um, is no longer needing oxygen uh, to breathe on his own, which is a huge, huge uh, step for him. And his sense of humor is... Uh, um, still strong, and uh, I think he's um, been a blessing to the nurses, and just as much as the nurses and doctors have been a blessing to him and his family. Um, I'm going to try to get back up there and see him again this week, but uh, just continue to pray for the, the Bailey family. Definitely. Any others? Well, let's bow for prayer at this time, and then we'll jump into a time of worship and just giving God praise for all that he's done. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are the God who hears, the God who heals, the God who saves. Father, we thank you that, that these pleas do not fall upon ears of stone or ears of wood or ears of metal, but that living ears that hear our prayer, that we can, through the blood of Jesus, offer up our petitions before you knowing that you will hear us not because of anything that we've done but because of what Christ has done for us so father we take it very seriously and we realize how precious it is when we come before you and we ask ask healing for someone uh, restoration for someone and even comfort for for someone so father all these that are in need of those things father we pray that you would indeed just anoint them be with them take care of them and the need they need that they need at this moment and father as we were allowed to be the hands and feet of jesus 
in any of these situations, please show us how we can do so. Father, we praise you for all the good reports that we've got. We thank you for so much, especially for welcoming Brother Duran into our family, into your kingdom. So, Father, we thank you so much for that. And, Father, as we go into this time of worship and listening to you, let your voice be the loudest in the room. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, church. Let's just sing a little bit. continue singing now. It's all about Jesus. Let's sing together. Who has the power to raise the dead? Who can save us from our sin? He is our hope, our righteousness. and bow. 
I stand amazed. Jesus, only Jesus. He's holy, holy, King Almighty, Lord, saints and angels all. straight to the Lord. Saints and angels all adore, I join with them and bow before Jesus, holy Jesus, Jesus, holy Jesus. Amen, church. You may be seated. And one as you're dismissed. And as you're being seated, I invite you to turn your, in, in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, this evening. John, chapter 12. As you're turning there, I'll just go ahead and tell you, one of my favorite movies, and probably a lot of us will say this is one of our favorite movies, probably, argue, it's, it's argued, it's probably in the top three of the best sports movies of all time, it's Remember the Titans. A lot of us remember seeing that movie. Wonderful. Absolutely wonder. And a lot of us are wondering how Denzel didn't get nominated for an Academy Award for that one. <clears throat> but one of the just absolutely great movie, great, great points along the way as you're as you're as you're watching it. But one of the turning point scenes in the movie, if you think back to it, if you've seen it, happens early on when they're at sur- summer camp, you know. Uh, Gary and Julius, they've been at loggerheads. I mean, from the time they got on the bus to the time they got in the dorm, they find out they're rooming together. They don't like that. They've been fighting. They get on the field, and they get, they're trying to, trying to do practice drills, and still, they're just going to loggerheads, can't, trying, to, trying to fight for supremacy. Who's going to be the one that's in charge? Who's going to call the shots? And basically, they're just literally at, at, to the point where the coach blows the whistle, and he realized, first off, in his wisdom, he realizes the motivating factor of all this is just one thing is just fear. They don't know each other. They don't know how to work together. They never had to work together. So it's a, it's a fear of, is that person going to be better than me? You know, is that, is that person going to take my spot? Is that person going to, no, you know, and so basically there's a, there's a, there's a fear between them. So Coach, you know, he, you remember the scene where he lines them up and he, and he tells them, he says, we've got to conquer our fears. We're going to find out who the coward is. Remember, he lines them up. They're facing each other, and they have to do running in place drills, and he taps them on the shoulder, and they have to hit each other, and they have to hit real hard. And, he, and he's, he's kind of berating them. He said, a coward won't hit. A coward won't tackle. A coward won't block. And he's literally just laying into them. This is what it means to be, to be someone who's going to play, not to be a coward. And then, you know, Good old lovable blue just, Coach, we've been out here all day. We need a water break. Oh, boy. You know, the coach blows the whistle, and, and the, the other assistant coach just shakes his head like, oh, no, shouldn't have said that. You know, and that's when he gets in his face, and he tells him, water makes you weak. Water makes you a coward. Water washes blood off your uniform. You're not supposed to get blood on my uniform. So he makes the entire team do the up-down drills until they're literally almost sick because he's trying to knock – knock their, you know, their sass out of them so they'll finally actually listen to him and, and actually do what he wants to do. 
But a whole time he's talking about what it means to be a coward, you know. And over the course of the season, you know, his, his whole point is to drive it to where they take their mind off hating each other and take the, if, if they're going to hate something, he's just saying, let them hate me for all the, the pain I'm putting them through. He's like, I can take that, no problem. And over the course of the season, they begin to really gel. But the stakes get higher and higher, you remember? Because if he loses one game, he's out. And by this point, most of the players have bought in to this playing scheme. The coaches have bought into his playing scheme. Most of them have. But, you know, there were those some that didn't buy in. You know, Gary had a friend, a longtime friend, that wouldn't buy in, just never quite got into it. The coach, Coach Yost, had a friend that, 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 that they'd been friends for years. Their kids had played together, grown up together, and they went their separate ways over this whole, over whether or not this was the right thing to do. And by the end of it, Coach Yost even loses out on getting to the Hall of Fame, at least on that season. If you know the story, about two or three years later, they finally realized that they made a mistake and they let him into the Hall of Fame. And it was because Coach Boone, actually, the, the real Coach Boone, went to the Virginia High School Hall of Fame and said, you are crazy for not letting this man in. If you know the movie, at the very end, when, the, when he looks at him and says, says, you're a Hall of Famer in my book, that's a reference to that he was going to go to bat for him because he had gone to bat for him. So, but it cost them. Fall, you know, falling after Coach Boone, even though they knew it was the right thing to do, it cost them. And you, and you, saw, the, and you saw the people who walked away because they just couldn't buy into it. You know, and when you look at it, if you look back at the beginning of the season, you know, they, they didn't know who was who at the beginning of the season. Everybody was feeling kind of the same way. But unbeknownst to them, in the whole thing of coaches and players, there were basically two kinds of people, two kinds of guys out there. There were the followers and there were the phonies. The followers who were going to follow Coach Boone wherever he was leading them on this, trusting what, that he knew what he was doing, and then there were the phonies who were going to play along to get along and just do whatever they could. And in that spirit tonight, I want to ask you, thinking about in this passage we're going to read, are you a follower or are you a phony? So let's look in John chapter 12, beginning of verse 1. Now, I'm reading for, um, from New King James. It's going to be a little different from what you're seeing on the screen. Um, I have trouble with the these, the vowels, and everything, and I end up talking like this. And it's hard enough to understand me as it is. So, I, I, I read, in, I, when I, every time I get up here, I, it's always New King James. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There, were, there they made a, him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii? And given to the poor. This he said, not this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but you do not have, but me you do not have always. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in these times right now. You are the one who, who divides even joint and marrow, and you, you see into our hearts. Reveal to us the places where we need to change. Re reveal to us if we're a follower or if we're a phony, and give us the strength to adjust where need be. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, to give you some backstory into this, verse 1 reminds us, Jesus has returned to Bethany after the last time he was there, which is when he, he raised Lazarus from the dead. So, and this was a house that he frequented. This was a place that he loved to come by and visit. If he was passing through the region, he would stop over at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. And as we survey the scene, it doesn't take much to see who are the followers and who is the phony. But before we get into that, let's just look, let's lay out the scene. We got, we, we're sitting in the house. 
There's the table that, that, that the people are reclining by. Uh, Lazarus is lounging around the table with Jesus and the disciples, and he's got to have a big smile on his face. You know, he's got to have a big smile on his face. Mary is right there with him. You know, she, you know she's right there with him. She wa- she's, wants to be just as, as close to Jesus as she can be. And Martha is in the house serving. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? If you, if you think back and if you look in Luke chapter 10, you'll notice a similar scene was going on when Jesus came to Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. Lazarus was sitting at the table. Je- um, Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus and Martha was serving. Do you remember that? You need to remember that because that's going to be on the test at the end of the, of the lecture. Well, I got your attention, didn't I? Well, I was just going to tell you, these are the followers. And last, we see the disciples sitting around the table, including Judas. The 11 other disciples of Jesus, they're the followers. But as you've probably already guessed, Judas is the phony. So looking at these followers and this one phony, we can see the characteristics in their lives and decisions that exemplify who they are, or more importantly, whose they are. So what are the characteristics of a follower? of Jesus versus a phony. That's what I want us to look at this evening from this, from this text. First thing I want you to see is this, number one, a follower looks to Jesus. A phony looks to others. A follower looks to Jesus. A phony looks around to others. Look at verse two. They made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. And then you see in verse 3, Mary is right there as well. Jesus knew he had an open invitation to stay in fellowship in this home. He was an honored guest every time he came through, especially this time. Now, I want you to think for a second. What joy must it have been to Mary and Martha and Lazarus to know that Jesus knew he was welcome in their home? That the Savior of the world was welcome into their home, that they knew that they had made a place where he would feel welcome. What a joy that must have been. Brother, sister, can you say that about your house? Is Jesus welcome in your home? If so, you're a follower. You've made a home for him. That's good because he's made a home for you. But especially this time, imagine what might have been going, just Think about what might have been going through the mind of Lazarus sitting around that table. He's sitting around in his house. He's sitting around the table with the king. And just a few weeks ago, he was sitting around the king's house, the table with the king. He's probably smiling eye to eye, grinning ear to ear, eye to eye, just going, this is so cool. You think this table's awesome? Wait till you see the one you're going to next. You know, notice Lazarus wants to be as close to Jesus as possible. If if anyone could truly say about Jesus, I owe him my life, it definitely was Lazarus. And Mary's right beside him once again. She's sitting at his feet. She's not content to be just far away or or in, in the shadows or in the fringes or even kind of, you know, close but not too close or You know, she wants to be right up there with Jesus. You know, and think about this. Have you ever been in a place, have you ever been in a worship time where you knew right when you walked in the room, the the Spirit of the Lord was in that room? How many of you can say, I've been in one of those situations? Walked into a room, and you you can honestly say, the Spirit of the Lord is in this room. Uh, about 10 years ago, Hannah and I went to a concert in, in Austin. The Gettys were doing a concert, 3,000 seat auditorium. And when we walked in there, I almost started weeping because the Spirit of the Lord was in that room. It was tangible. It was almost like I could, you, you could almost hear the Lord. Speak. But that room had been prayed over. That room had been, it wasn't just, Lord, we hope the music works right. We hope that, we hope that key change will measure 43 works fine. No, it was. They had prayed, literally prayed over that room. So when you walked in, you knew you were, you were in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and you knew he was fixing to say something. And so I didn't want to sit at the back. 
I didn't want to sit in the middle. I didn't want to sit even up in the front section. I was on the third row. Why was I on the third row? Because they blocked the other two off. I wanted to get as close as I could. Not because I wanted to see the Gettys. I mean, they're wonderful folks. But I wanted to be near Jesus. Have you ever been that way? And this, let's not forget Martha. She's serving in the house, but as opposed to the last time that Jesus came through and she served, the last time she was serving out of duty. This time she's serving out of a grateful heart. For the, she's, more, she's more than willing to serve the man who brought her brother back to, back to life. It's amazing how that changes things, isn't it? These are the followers who want nothing more than to serve him for who he is and for what he's done. Now let's contrast that with Judas. Judas is sitting around the same table. Same table as Lazarus, same table as Mary, same table as disciples. Martha's within earshot. She can hear everything that's going on. Judas is right there. The disciples were honored guests in the home as well. And Judas had the same opportunity to be with Jesus. In fact, he had a greater opportunity. When, When Jesus left the crowds, Jesus went with him. He was a disciple. When he slept in the, when Jesus slept in a hollow or under a tree somewhere and you know, Judas had to do it too. When he healed the ten lepers or fed 5,000 men or even called Lazarus from the grave, Judas had a front row seat to see all of it. But yet here's Judas. He's observed, instead of focusing on Jesus, he's observing all the people around him. He's looking around to see what everybody else is doing. He has a chance to glean from the king of kings. And he chooses to Observe, he observes Mary's worshipful act with the eyes of contempt. Lord, she can't do that. It ain't dignified. It ain't proper. Kind of sounds like another guy. If you, if you think back in the Old Testament, there was an Old Testament priest named Eli. If you go back to the book of 1 Samuel, you don't have to go there. I'll just paraphrase it for you. In, in, the, in the book of 1 Samuel, you read about Hannah, the wife of Elkanah. She's barren. And because she's barren, she's ostracized by the other wife in the house, and she's also ostracized by the other ladies in the community, and she is brokenhearted over this. And all she wants is a child that she can turn around and give right back to the Lord. So in her desperation, in her, in her weeping, in her sorrow, in her grief, she goes to the tabernacle. And she won't even go anywhere close. She just wants to be, be, be there. And she kind of hides, hides in a corner somewhere. And all she does is get on her face and cry out to God. But she, her weeping and her, her sorrow is so great she can't utter a sound. And there's Eli, the priest, doing the priestly duty, looks over and sees her. And all he, all he can think is, what's that drunk woman doing there? And he goes over and he scolds her for being drunk. Rather than trying to minister to her as he is supposed to do as a priest, he is scolding her for being drunk. And she finally says, no, my Lord, I'm not drunk I'm sorrowful. And she explains the whole situation. Now I'll give you like credit. When he figures that, when he hears this, he offers a blessing. And, he's, and he prays that God would indeed grant her request, and he does. But notice the symbol. If you go back and read, if you read what Eli says to Hannah and what Judas is saying in this situation, it's the same condescending tone. Lord, look what they're doing. That ain't right. Both men, that's not where the and that's not where the similarity is in. If you do some more study in Eli, and we know about Judas, both men were not in a right relationship with God. You know, Eli unknowingly stood in condemnation from God for, for, because of his inability to control his home. Eli had two sons that were wreaking havoc on the nation of Israel because they were usually using priestly privilege to commit heinous sins. And Eli was doing nothing. Eli was like that, that, that parent in Walmart with a toddler that won't behave. Come back here, come back here, come back here, come back here, come back here. Don't do that, don't do that. No, no, come on, don't, don't put that down. You know, and the, and the kid's got like two flash waters on every end. He's walking around hitting everything. Ah, 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 ah. And all the parents do it. Oh, just don't do that. Oh, you're making a mess. Oh, they're going to have to clean that up. Don't do that. And you want to, you know, I want to go to the, I want to go to the, the, the men's clothing section, find the largest, you know, leather belt I can find. Go ahead and turn and say, try this. Take two of these and call me in the morning. 
Eli has literally done nothing. He's, he's, he, he's tried to say, tried to reason with them, but they won't do anything. And because of this, because he does not manage his household, because he does not manage his sons, it will cost him his life. It will cost the nation of Israel its sovereignty as a nation. And it will cost them the Ark of the Covenant. Symbolically, it, it would represent the Spirit of the Lord departing the nation of Israel for a time. That's pretty serious. As a result of this broken relationship with God that Eli, you know, because his fellowship with the Lord is broken, because, because he's in this sin, because Judas, is, his mind is being controlled by sin and not being controlled by the Holy Spirit, that, they're, that, that, that they see what's going on and they don't act in the Holy Spirit. They act like a human, like a person who's acting of their own will, a person who sees and makes an incorrect assumption about the life of Hannah or the life of Mary. And the same can be said for Judas. Judas is not looking at the situation through the lens of grace, knowing that there's equal foot, equal ground at the foot of the cross. He's looking critically at those around him simply to make himself look or at least feel good about himself. So the question I have, stop right there. Are you a follower or are you a phony? Well, consider, here, consider in here for an example. When you came in this evening, what were you looking for? Were you looking to offer prayer, intercession to the God of heaven? Were you looking to offer praise for who he is, what he's done? Were you looking to hear what he has to say to his church? What about Sunday mornings? You know, do you walk in here into the presence of your king, or, or do you just walk in sizing up the room? Well, they're not here today. Oh, they may not. I don't know. Who's that people? I don't recognize them. It's not, fair. It's not right that I don't know who they are. They need to we need to have name tags around here or something because, and you start being critical of everything. Have you spent time in prayer asking God to give you ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit is saying to his church? Or, forgive me for saying this, do you walk in complaining that the, the Crimson Tide only won by 20 when they should have won by 60? I use that as a, as a reference, and I'll just tell you real quick. When I was in seminary, no offense, in seminary, the people I met there that are from Alabama may be scared of y'all, okay? Now, I love y'all. I mean, let's face it, everyone in this room, we, we get along because we're all, we're all kind of a little bit on the crazy side, but it's the same crazy, so it works, right? Okay? Um, but when, we, when I went to seminary, I mean, of course, you know, being a Razorback fan, you just go, yeah, I'll root for them, but I'm not expecting much. You know, and, but oh, my Lord. And especially... Down there when you had, you know, Baton Rouge is 30 miles away and all the Mississippi schools and all the Bama schools are convert and even Florida students converging into this one little isolated campus. Oh, my Lord, it was awful. And, but I'll just tell you, I mean, <laughs> I was gonna, just going to share you with, share with this. There was one student down there that, I mean, his, his blood was indeed crimson red. And he's, I mean, to the point where I was literally scared of this guy. Graduate, move up to San Antonio, and I, he's, he's a Facebook friend of mine. I'm watching him. He's one of those guys that it's not just enough that his team, lo his team wins. Your team has to lose and lose badly, and he's going to make sure you know about it. I mean, he's berating people. I mean, he's puffing up, he's puffing up his team. He's, he's knocking down the other team. And, you know, this is a guy that I was, I was a pretty good friend with in seminary. I mean, he's a guy that's supposed to be in ministry. That he's training for ministry to, to share the gospel with people. And it was, everything he was doing was just so off-putting. And I finally sent him a private message. I didn't call him out in public because that's not what a brother does. You go to the person, per, and I couldn't go all the way from San Antonio back to Kentucky where he's living. But I could send him a private message, and I said, no offense. But if, if I were to judge your life based on what I'm seeing, your trust is more in the crimson tide than the crimson blood. He didn't like that too much. But after about a week, he sent me, thanks, Reed. And I, I, I remember him once again. Once again, I'm a Razorback fan. I have no leg to stand on. <laughs> I have nothing to brag about. 
So, but, you know, what is the thing that occupies your attention as you're gathering? When we gather, when the gathering song begins, you know, whether you know the song or not, do you allow the Lord to begin to speak to you, show you, prepare your heart, make it fertile to receive the word that Jeremy's going to preach or whoever's going to be up here is going to preach that day? The whole point of our singing and offering praise to God is so that we literally allow God to make our lives fertile so that he can plant his word in us. Did you know that? Yes, we sing because we worship. We sing to offer praise. We sing to instruct. But sometimes we sing because God needs to do a work in us. And he's using that to, to get the ground ready. Just like all you people who, who plant gardens, you know you got to get the ground ready before you even start planting. Same thing. At the, you know, at the outset of the preaching, do you engage with the scripture as well as the speaker to glean what the Holy Spirit is trying to teach you or reveal what needs to be dealt with in your life? Or do you look around to see, you know, what baby is that that's crying or who's coughing too loud or who's outfit that, in your opinion, just don't belong in church? Let me tell you. You know, do you walk out of here like the shepherds who left the manger telling everyone all that you've heard and seen? Or do you walk out complaining to whomever will listen about the miserable experience you just went through, hoping to find someone, anyone, who will agree with you? Because, you know, misery loves company. And just a little side note on this. First church I served at, I was in college, served there for two years, graduated, went off to Texas to be a band director, came back six years later, and that, that church asked me to come back in and serve, the, serve part-time again as a, as a worship. When I got back to the second time, that church had changed horribly. Horribly, horribly, horribly. I won't go into details, but suffice it to say, the pastor who had, just, who had come in right after I got there the first time, he was on his last leg. He was worn, slapped out. It, it was time for him to go. It was, it, you know, he just, it was time for him to go. He knew it. The church knew it. All he asked was the church to give him a little time to, they didn't want to, they didn't want to do, offer anything. And people began to leave. People began to badmouth. I, I was sitting at a restaurant in that town. Someone, some people from the church who had left came over to you. Are you still over there? Well, yeah. Why are you over there? Well, the Lord hadn't told me to leave yet. I don't know why you would want to be over there. Oh, that, 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 that preacher, that preacher, you know, he just started just badmouthing. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, for starters, be very careful when you go after God's man. Because when you do that, you're standing on dangerous ground. You don't believe me? Ask God about that. God's going to protect his man. Number two, what church do you go to? And he told me. And I said, you know what? I would never go to your church. Why well, wouldn't you go to my church? My church is awesome. We get to, uh, I said, no, 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 no. I would never worship a God who allows you to act the way you're acting. He turned around and walked out. To this day, I've never seen him. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. And yes, the church we were in had problems, big time problems. But for, for someone to say that they're a church member, to, to go around bad mouthing, and look, I'm a big guy. You, you walk out of here, you can say anything you want about me, because it doesn't matter what you say, I promise you, I'm worse. Okay? You don't know the half of it. Even my wife doesn't know the sins that are in my head that the Lord has to forgive me of, that I have to, or not has to, offers forgiveness for, that are between me and him. So whatever you say about me, good or bad, I promise you, I'm worse. But do me a favor. If you do, that's fine. Go out, tell everybody how awful I am. But promise me that in the next, biz, in the next breath, you'll tell them how awesome Jesus is. He deserves it. He's worthy of it. You can badmouth me all, all day long. And, and if I'm with you, I'll agree with you. Yeah, I'm horrible. I'm rotten. But let me tell you about my Jesus. So a follower looks to Jesus while a phony looks to others for approval. Also, number two, a follower serves Jesus. A phony 
serve self. Look at verse 6. Judas said, Judas said this, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put into it. Now look back at verse 2. Look back at verse 2. And you see the one little sentence, three words there. And Martha served. Talked about this. Remember what happened last time? Mary, Martha, and, and Lazarus are in the house. Lazarus is, at the, is at, around the table. Mary's at the feet of Jesus, and Martha's serving. And she's looking at Mary with a very contemptuous look. She, and finally goes with Jesus. Lord, do you not even care? And she, she actually says in verse, in verse 40, Martha, it says, Martha was distracted with, with much serving, and she approached Jesus and said to him, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. So Martha's attitude was a little rotten that day, wouldn't you say? But now look at her. Look at here in, verse, in chapter 12. She's serving once again because that's, that's her calling. She feels that's what she's called to do. But notice there's no indication that she's looking at anybody else except Jesus. She's not complaining that Mary is at the feet of Jesus. She's, not complaining, she's certainly not complaining that Lazarus is around the table. At least he's alive again. And once again, after seeing your brother rise from the dead, it probably put things into perspective for Martha. And now Martha's okay with Mary doing what she's doing and Lazarus doing what he's doing and the disciples doing what they're doing. And none of the other guests have a problem when Mary opens the oil and begins to anoint the feet of Jesus. Except one person. And notice when I say no one had a problem with it, the one who was being worshipped had no problem with it either. Now that should have been an indicator to Judas that this is okay. When the God of the universe accepts your worship, you know you're doing it right. But in verse 6, Jesus, you know, once again, notice that, and notice that, but notice how John, you know, Ju Judas actually has the audacity to try to claim moral high ground over the God of the universe. You know, imagine how much self-centeredness that would require. <laughs> Look what John says about him. Verse 5, you know, he says, this he said, not that he cared for the poor because he was a thief. John does not have anything nice to say about Judas. Judas is all about self. And remember, John is the beloved apostle. He's a majority of his, his gospel, his epistles, and even the book of Revelation, Revelation is about the, the love of Jesus. How much Jesus loves us. That's one of the prevailing themes in all of his writing. But John doesn't hold anything back. You know, and when a guy who, who preaches about love doesn't have much good to say, you might want to do some reality check on some things. You know, you know it's all for Jesus, it's what I want, what I desire, what I think is needed, or what's best, or what's right. And we're all guilty of worshiping, you know, it, it, worshiping the idol of self-preference -pre all the time. You know, we, 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 we get that attitude, oh, you know, if they would just listen to me, it, it, it would turn out right. Or they don't like it the way, they don't, they, don't, they don't do things the way I like it. Or they don't do things the way I want it. And when that happens, we just got to ask the Lord to forgive us, to humble us, to remind us he's the object of worship. He's the one we're worshiping. And if he accepts the form of worship, so should we. A follower of Jesus will serve Jesus, and only Jesus. That's the reason why I picked that song, will serve Jesus, only Jesus. A phony does a good job of trying to seem like they're serving the kingdom, while all the while building up their own empire. A true follower possesses the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish great and mighty things. A phony, in the words of Paul to Timothy, has a form of godliness but denies its power. Classic example, and to me one of the funniest passages when you read it, in, in all the scripture of, of, of this idea of, you know, a phone, of, of someone who's a phony is in Acts chapter 19. You don't have to turn there either, but I'll just paraphrase this one. Acts chapter 19, beginning of verse 11. Let me just read it to you. If you want to turn there, you're, you're certainly more than welcome, but Acts chapter 19, verse 11. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and evil spirits went out of them. 
Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had spirits, saying, this is what they said, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Seva, a Jewish chief priest who did the same thing. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This became known to both all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Why did they attempt such a foolish gesture? Simple. They were jealous. They wanted the recognition Paul was getting without the actual power to do so. They didn't, they didn't care about actually healing somebody, actually serving somebody, seeing God be glorified in, in what they were doing. They just wanted the outward result. They were what Jesus t- was, was, was warning the people about when he said they have their reward. <laughs> they wanted notoriety? They got notoriety. I mean, think about that. You're, you're, you're standing out there in the marketplace, and all of a sudden you see, you know, 11 guys in their, in their birthday seat come streaking through the, the marketplace. It's like, what's going on here? You imagine the water cooler talk the next day? Or at the hair salon, oh, did you see that? Yeah. Didn't Ray Stevens write a song about this? Yeah, but don't worry, we covered Ethel's eyes this time. I had to do it. I'm sorry, I had to do it. Yeah, they wanted the notoriety. They, had their, they got the reward, didn't they? You want to be a follower of Jesus? But so it, then as Joshua said, choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my, ha- my house, we will serve the Lord. You want to be a phony? Just keep making yourself look good. That always ends up, ends up well, right? So a follower looks to Jesus while a phony looks to others for approval. A follower serves Jesus while phony serves selves. And finally, number three, a follower acts in the will of Jesus. A phony criticizes those actions. A follower acts in the will of Jesus. A phony criticizes those actions. Plain and simple, a phony can't act in the will of Jesus. The Holy Spirit does not rule over them. And what did Jesus say? Apart from me, you can do. So therefore, they can do nothing. All they can do is be like the two Muppets that sit up in the crow's nest. You know, make their jokes, make everybody else feel bad about actually doing something. Well, that happens a lot, doesn't it? Once again, Judas, Judas is the only person in this very full house to offer criticism to what Mary did. Two siblings and 11 disciples had nothing to say, but what is most noticeable in the situation is the fact that Judas rejected a form of worship that Jesus accepted. It is a sad commentary that the greatest criticism of the worship of God's people actually happens inside the walls of the church rather than outside the walls of the church. We have no right to declare wrong that which God has declared right. And this criticism happens on all sides of the worship spectrum. So if you're sitting there thinking, well, you ain't talking to me. I'm talking to everyone. I wish, well, actually I don't because, let me tell you, on Sunday morning, I usually stand about right here. And just to let you know, to me, that's where the word of God is to be proclaimed, Okay. So I stand back here when we're singing. That's, that's just my personal preference. I'm sorry. And some people, I've seen people stand right there, no problem. But that's, their, that's why I do what I do. Okay, okay. So I'm standing out here. We're singing our song. No matter what song it is, I can see it on your face, whether you know it, whether you like it, whether you hate it. I can see it. I've seen your faces on the songs you hate so much that I could win big time if you and I ever decided to play a game of high-stakes poker. Now, not, don't, do, don't go out here and say, Reads, Reads endorsing gambling. No, I'm not. Don't do it. 
In fact, if you played against me because I've seen this stuff, I'd win. So I'm actually, you know, putting myself in the poorhouse by not endorsing it. But what I'm saying is this. I see the look on your face when we're singing what you don't like. I've seen the look on your face when you look around and other people are singing a song and you're, just, you're sitting there looking like, how can they sing that? That's not a worship song. Let me just tell you something. This is a promise I made to y'all that when I got here and this promise I'll keep to you. Every song we sing on this platform will come from the inspiration of the Word of God. First and foremost. I promise you, we will not sing, just as Jeremy will tell you, he will not preach any other gospel than the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will not sing any other gospel in this church than that of Jesus Christ. Because there is no gospel apart from Jesus Christ. About five years ago, I was at, we had a church town hall meeting. This is a church in Meridian. And um, ironically, that very morning, we had, we, our choir had sung a special that for the first time, life began to come into that church. Were you all there that Sunday we sang This Blood and Virgie did the, did the solo? I've never done anything like this before. We got to the end of it. I didn't realize what had happened because I'm facing this way. And the choir's going. I have my, our little praise ensemble over the side. We're, we finish up. Unbeknownst to me, the entire congregation was on their feet, worshiping. I turned around. I could see on their face. People who didn't, people who literally were chess pieces when they normally stand up. They were worshiping the Lord. And the first time I'd ever seen that, I mean, I'd never been, I'd never been the, lead, the worship leader of a church that was, that was something like that actually happened. I turned to the choir, and I turned to the praise team, and I said, go back, and I, I, showed, I told them where we're starting. They knew exactly where it was, and we started there, and we did it again. I've never done an encore of a song that we were doing in a worship service ever before, and I, I, I just prayed, Lord, this may be the thing that kills me, but if it is, I do it for your glory anyway, and we did it again, and I turned around the congregation. I said, now you sing with us, and we did it. And uh, so that, that happened that morning. That night, we were, having, we were scheduled to have a town hall meeting to talk about the future and direction of the church. And boy, I tell you what, everything, some folks in the church could fire at me because I was doing all this newfangled music that they didn't like. They were firing everything they had at me. And I was, I was like, what just happened? Six hours ago, we were praising the Lord. We didn't care what we were singing. And now it, it was basically, they were literally, I, I think they were about ready to run me on a rail. And they, they, they wanted me to give an explanation as to why I wouldn't sing their particular song. And I, I had to, I said, give me, one, give me one minute. And I sat there, you know how the, the Lord says, I will give you what to say. I prayed, Lord, if I don't stand up for, you, for the direction you've called me now, I might as well hang it up. And the Lord said, you're right. He said, everything that happened in San Antonio, everything that's happened here to this point, I have trained you for this moment. Speak. So here's what I told them. I said, folks, every Sunday, and this, and this can apply here. Now, one, now, let me say this. I love y'all. Y'all are wonderful. I, it's a joy to worship with you every Sunday. Yes, I know there's songs you don't like. I know there's songs you wish we would do better. I get that. And there's times I go back there after, after my office, drink my cup of coffee, and go, what did, was I thinking on that one? Okay? I promise you, that happens. Y'all are wonderful, and I love you. So I, I'm just going to say, this is not a criticism on First Baptist Hamilton, but I'm just telling you, here's what happened. I said, basically, if you figure, in, in, on any given Sunday, I have four, maybe five songs that I get to pick. And if you, I, don't, I, hope, I don't know if you figured this out yet, but whatever our song selection is going to be based on whatever he's preaching. Because I know where he's going. Now, I don't ask him what he's preaching. I say, what's your passage? Because if the Lord's talking to me and the Lord's talking to him, he's probably going to give us the same message that he wants you to hear. Does that make sense? And it's been amazing how many times that's happened. That's, why I that's one of the reasons why I love being here. Because he, he'll, he'll, he'll say something in a message. I'm going, we just sang that. I look, and, and then every night I also go, we just sang that. Yeah, we did. So, so I said, we got four or five songs on any given Sunday that we can pick like last sunday the rich young ruler okay well there's a the, one, the first one I, the, the first one i picked was the one we sang about the rich young ruler because 
If he's going to preach about him, might as well sing about him too. And there's about 6,000 hymns that are available in modern hymnody. When I say that, from the year 1600 forward. In the 400 year history of modern worship, there's about 6,000 songs I can pick. I get to pick four. My odds of picking your favorite are very, very slim. Okay? So I promise you, if I don't pick your favorite, it's not because I'm, I'm mad at you or because I don't like you or because I don't like your music. It's, I literally, I can tell you, I can, and I'm saying this in front of the Lord and y'all, I pray over every song we're going to sing. And I told them that. I said, I pray over every song we're going to sing. If you've got a problem with the songs we're singing, you take it up with the Lord. And I said, here's another thing, and I want you to understand this. And this is something that, that I've carried with me ever since. I said, let's suppose I go into my office to plan a worship service, and all I can think of is, what songs do you want? What songs do you want? And I plan the entire worship service based on the songs I think you would want to hear, the songs that you would want to sing, the songs that you would want to have in your worship service. Guess what? I failed to worship the Lord. I'm now worshiping you. I mean, I saw some shocked faces in this room because they'd never seen me, you know, far off like this. But I was telling them, and I said, folks, I love everyone in this room. But none of y'all died to save me from my sins. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to follow the one who does, who did. And that ended it for about a, you know, a week or so, then it started up again. You know, when someone offers authentic worship that, that differs even slightly from our desired expression of worship, Sometimes we bristle in the thought that if we might think that if God accepts their form of worship, he might not accept ours. No, that's not the case at all. I've seen worship videos of a, tri a Christian tribe church in Africa worshiping under a tree. And part of the worship, they were singing and dancing and running circles around the tree. But you could see the joy of the Lord on their faces and the translation of, their, of the song they were singing was, How Great Thou Art. They were worshiping. Now, if I do that, I won't hurt something. I mean, look at me. But they were worshiping. And how dare I go over there and tell them, well, you're not worshiping the way us Baptists in America worship. You're not doing it right. That's the same logic that says if you don't, know the, if you don't study the King James Version of the Bible, you're not reading the real Bible. Which, we, that's a whole other topic for a whole other day. But I used to hear that all the time. You're not reading the King James Version. You're not reading the real Bible. Well, neither did the people 1,600 years prior to it. So I guess they're not Christians either. In the great words of the longtime pastor of FBC Houston, John Bazzano, we are all in for a real shock when we get to heaven and realize that God actually does like rap. <laughs> Instead, let's resolve to be like the rest of the people in the house that day. Let's don't be like Judas. Let's be like everybody else. Martha worships through serving. She doesn't complain that no one else does. Mary worships through anointing her Savior's feet. She doesn't take any notice of, any, of anyone else what they think. She doesn't care what they think. Lazarus is at, and the disciples are dying in the fellowship with Jesus, and they're content to sit around the table with the king. And it was a poor attitude that kept Judas from experiencing firsthand the wonder of worshiping Jesus face to face. So are you a follower or a phony? All of us at one time or another have allowed personal preferences to keep us from worshiping Jesus in spirit and truth. But Mary, Martha, and Lesson, Lazarus, they learned that lesson of recognizing how precious it is to focus on Jesus, only Jesus. When we gather this Sunday, remember we are not just gathering together with one another. We are joining together with the Spirit of God that unites us as a family of believers. How precious it is when the family of God gathers together with the Spirit of God to worship the Son of God to the praise of the Father God. Is there anyone here willing to say that their personal preference and and the building up of their empire is more important than listening and fellowshipping with the, word, with the God of all history. Think back to that movie again. 
at the beginning of the movie, they didn't know who was follower or thorny. They didn't know who was going to stick it out. They didn't know who was going to leave. They all were starting off together. By the end, it was obvious who was a follower and a thorny. Church, let me just tell you this. One day, when the Lord calls us home, there's no phony, there'll be no phonies in heaven. One reason that it's very important that you, that you examine yourself, as Paul says, that you know that you're a follower and not a phony. But even now, here on this earth, can we all agree that in our nation, it's getting harder and harder to be a, fo a follower? A whole lot more easy to be a phony. Our nation is, is, is going to make it worse. It's going to get worse. It, they're, they're, the day is coming, and in some places of our, of, our, of our nation, it's already here where you cannot proclaim the truth of what God's Word says on a matter without facing persecution or jail time. And that day, is, and that day believe it or not, one of these days, as much as we like to believe that we're kind of closed off, it's on its way. It will hit here. And I was telling Brother Kevin... Before the service, the day may come where the law of the land, even the law of Hamilton, the law of Marion County says that we cannot declare what God's word says about the lifestyle you live or about abortion or about any of these things that, that, that the world wants to, wants to say something completely opposite. The, the, the day may come where the law says, you can't say what thus saith the Lord, or you will go to jail. There may be a day when, because of his duty, not because he wants to, but because of his duty, by us preaching, thus saith the Lord, by duty, Brother Kevin has to come and put the handcuffs on me. Because... I didn't violate, God, God, violate God's word. I violated man's law. You know what? A follower will say, here I am. A phony will say, oh, I take it back. I didn't mean to offend anyone. I didn't mean, you know, no, 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 no. It's, it's okay to live like how you want to. You do you. It's okay to kill your baby. It's not really a baby anyway. You see, see what I'm saying? The day is coming when you're going to have to, you will be required to stand before the world and say, I'm a follower of Jesus. If that means going to jail, I'm okay with it. For crying out loud, you realize you'll be counted among those first century believers that went to jail and even went to death. I have even told Hannah, I said, part of me rejoices in the fact that if I get taken to jail for my faith, man, what the best reason to get taken to jail for? You know, there's a whole lot of other reasons you can go to jail. At least that'd be a good one. So church, I challenge you this evening. Be a follower. Don't be a phony. And when those, when those phony attitudes begin to creep up, lay them at the altar. Ask God to deal, deal with you, work with you. And we gather this Sunday, let's just worship the Lord. Let's praise him, honor and glorify him. Let's exalt him to the highest place. Let's come expecting him to do something in us. Not in us, in us. Come expecting God to change you in some way. If every one of us does that, God's promise is he will inhabit the praise of his people. And that he, he wants to show us great and mighty things that we do not know. But we have to be ready to hear it. We have to be, have ears to hear. We have to have eyes to see. And we certainly have to have feet to go wherever he's called. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the evening you've given to us. Father, help us to, in all things to just trust you. Know where you're leading. Know what, what you've got for us. But more than anything, let us be followers. Let us fix our eyes upon you. Not let anything distract us from the side, from the inside, or from the outside. Let us follow you in all things. Let us trust you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're just going to sing this song together. It's, I'll tell you, it's one of the songs that, that the Lord used to get my attention about going to seminary. You'll see why in just a minute, or maybe you will. 
but it's one of those things if you can't sing it unless you really want to believe it and really want to do it but you know this song it says simply trust and obey let's sing together when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word what a glory to trust and obey. Thank you for this evening. Um, is there any announcements or anything that we need to let people know about before we get out of here this evening? Does everybody know anything? Yeah. Okay. Pray for Dean now. Pray for Pray for those who are going to be in here. Um, uh, I can't think of anything else right now. So anyway, let, let's pray and we'll dismiss. Father, thank you for the evening you've given to us. Thank you for allowing us to be in your presence. Thank you for giving us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to your church. And Father, now give us feet, as was demonstrated by the youth this evening, to go out and do what you have called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.